Welcome to Always Listening. We're your hosts. I'm Joel. I'm Jay. And I have to come up with something more original every single time I do this, or else the whole gig is a sham. <laughs> well, how about I uh, today it could be I'm Joel and I'm not buying a Mac Pro. How about that? Uh we could start there. Um uh we we are always listening. Uh this is your show where we try to break down for you the industry trends and news in the podcasting industry and space. Uh Jay and I have a combined years, a lot of years in <laughs> podcasting and radio. And uh we try to bring that knowledge to bear on everything that's going on uh in the space. Today is going to be heavily focused on Apple. And so for those of our audience and the podcasting uh, space in general that sort of abhors the fact that Apple is such a big player, this episode is probably not going to make you happy, I'm I'm afraid. Uh, We do have some other news for you. Uh, Jay's got some specific stuff that is not about Apple uh, that is going to be good news for everybody, though. So that's a little tease for you to stick around towards the end. But the fact of the matter is that Apple remains the largest player in the space until somebody else knocks the the crown off their head. Uh, 60% or so still of downloads across the industry as a whole come through Apple devices. And it's big news from the Apple industry or from, from the Apple uh, region of the industry as uh, they were conducting or still are conducting the WWDC event this week. That's the Worldwide Developers Conference. It's their annual event where they showcase what's next in software specifically for iOS. They're Uh, operating system for iPhone and iPad, or now only for iPhone, I should say, Uh, iPad OS, as it's now called on the iPad. Uh, They also show off uh, Mac OS, which is the operating system for Mac laptops and desktops. And all of that, of course, matters to us as podcasters, because as I said, 60 something percent of our listeners, most of us anyway, are using Apple devices to get there. So what changed? Um, Jay, I I told you before we started recording, I want to kind of frame this in that there were two big pieces of news that I think are going to be talked about a lot among podcasters after this event, even podcasters who don't follow Apple like I do. And out of those two pieces of news, there are two big misconceptions that are being spread pretty rapidly. And so I want to talk about both of those. The first one, the biggest one, the headline feature is, as we've been discussing the Apple iTunes application is going away. It's going to be ended at least on the Mac. If you have a Mac laptop or a desktop, no! in the next version this of can't the operating happen. system. No, yeah, Joel! No! iTunes is going away. So what's replacing what? it, Jay? Oh, We're getting three applications in its place. Uh, we're getting a Apple Music app, which will effectively be everything music-related that iTunes does today the music app will do in a much more streamlined, focused, fast, clean way. It strips out all of the things that don't deserve to be in in an application called iTunes or or Apple Music, and it only focuses on the features. It doesn't get rid of power features. There was a lot of concern that we would lose things like smart playlists. If you were an avid music listener, you might have used in the past the fact that iTunes has these like if and or then things that you can add in and you can you can create your own smart playlist things like only play music from these artists that I haven't heard in the past 3 weeks and that I haven't rated as a one star or less you know like that's a fairly complex bit of computation that you can apply to your own library and the Apple Music app on iOS and iPad hasn't been able to do those things the music app that's on Mac will what won't it do, Jay? It won't have podcasts in it. Podcasts Whoa, is now. No! I know. I know. It's no! the end of the world. Podcasts is now its own app. Now, if you've been listening to the show, you're not surprised by that. It was always going to be its own app. This was something that's been coming for a long time. Apple wanted, and if you look in the code, if you if you do things like the web search, we we talked recently about how Apple redid their web front for when you when you search for a podcast and a Apple uh, link is returned to you in that search. Now those links are playable on the web. You can click through and get a nice episode page or a show page and click the play button and hear it right there in the web, no matter what browser you're using. Those pages, though, seem to imply a disconnect because there was no way to click and open the iTunes application properly. They weren't connected. And the reason is because those pages wanted the podcast app that was yet to be announced. So in the next version of Mac OS, which is coming in the fall, it's going to be called Catalina. 
you're going to have the music app, you'll have the podcast app, and then you'll also have a TV application that will take care of the movies and TV stuff that comes in iTunes now. What about device sync, Jay? You've talked about you got the old school iPod, right? You love to use that in your car. How are you going to put uh, files on it? How are you going to put your podcasts on it? The syncing for devices is now going to be found in the Finder application of iOS. It'll be in the sidebar of your Finder. You can plug your iPhone in or your iPad or your iPod Touch or or what I'm assuming the older iPads as well will have support through this. You'll plug those in to the computer and you'll see them in the sidebar and you can do the different, you know, sync files to them or back up the device to your local computer or whatever you want to do. All those functions will still be available. So that is the headline feature. We're going to get podcasts on Mac. We're going to get chapter support. We're going to get uh, uh, all of the individual per show choices that we can do on the iPhone or the iPad, you're going to be able to do those on your Mac. We're going to get state syncing. So if you're listening to a show on your iPad and you want to restart it again or, or you know, pick it back up on your Mac, those will be handless uh, or, or seamlessly uh, handed off to one another. As a matter of fact, we'll even get the actual feature handoff, which is where if you're using your phone and then get near to your Mac, in the dock, the application that you're using on your phone is sort of like promoted on your Mac. Do you want to jump over and finish that um, process that you're completing on your mobile device, on your computer, now that you're on your computer? Yes, I would like to do that, Mac. Just click it, and it'll go right to where you are in your podcast. Very cool stuff. The other big thing that was announced as far as podcasts go, and this is where I want us to go back and forth a little bit and talk about what it actually means for podcasters, Jay. Transcription search. They're using, Mm. Apple is using machine learning, and they're going to start with the most popular podcasts, and then eventually the the goal is to drift down to everyone that's in the directory will have this. They are actually Mm. using machine learning to process the audio and, and categorize and catalog the content of the audio so that if I'm in the Apple Podcasts app and search for Game of Thrones... Not only episodes or shows that have Game of Thrones in the show title or the episode title, but shows and episodes that mention Game of Thrones or discuss Game of Thrones in the content, but don't even put it in their show notes. Those episodes and and, uh, podcasts will be surfaced as well, at least theoretically. How will they be surfaced as far as like what is the order of service uh, serviceability? It'll be by popularity, folks. So your obscure podcast that has four downloads and they're all from your mother and uh, you mentioned Game of Thrones and you don't put it in your show notes and you don't put it in your episode title and you don't put it in your uh, show title, you're still not going to be found over the 150 very popular shows that are talking about Game of Thrones. But – the idea is that the esoteric niche topics or niche niche topics that some of us do cover, those will help us find those really uh, rare shows or those really uh, super you know small shows, and in general, it will allow the content to be king. And I'm very excited about that. That's going to be. It's not going to fix the so discoverability yes. problem, but it will help. Yes and no. Right. So what you just mentioned as your example is 100 percent true. Right. The guy who doesn't put who's talking about Game of Thrones in his, you know, in the podcast that only mom downloads and he doesn't put any mention of it anywhere in any of his show notes or whatever. Somebody's going to come across that if they even get to the bottom of that search and they're going to be like, why do I need to listen to this show? Like, what's important about this show where I get concerned about it is. Take a guy like me who does an NFL show and I cover a myriad of topics and sometimes I highlight them in the show notes and sometimes I don't. And sometimes, you know, we'll talk about all 32 teams maybe in a show, but I'm not going to write all 32 teams necessarily in that show description. And I don't have a giant audience. As a matter of fact, I think the audience on my football show is smaller than the audience on this particular show. So that's something that that it would be great because it's going to help me, maybe. But at the end of the day, if I'm still at the bottom of the list, even though my content is like, and, and it's horrible that I used myself as an example, but even though I know my content is better than, say, the content being produced by the most popular 
shows, it's still not necessarily going to rise to, you know, content do- isn't king in that sense that it's still going to rise to the top of that particular search result. And that's a, f- a very good point. Very good point there. What I, what I mostly meant was that the idea of gaming things through SEO should be over. If both Google and Apple say that in the next few years, their plan is to transcribe automatically and then catalog all of the actual content of the episodes, then the search results in the future, again, this isn't an immediate thing, but over time, the search results that we find in our podcast apps should only be about that, the actual content, not about, there's no gaming of the system at that point is what I'm saying. If you're, if you don't talk about that in the episode, then it's not going to surface. But I would still imagine that the shows that, that say are gaming the system are still going to get preferential treatment to the guy who has nothing about it in his, See, in his podcast. You know I, what I'm saying? I wonder because you, you look at what Apple has done. So they, first of all, they deprecated keywords, right? Like once upon a time, you could put keywords into shows and episodes and those would be searchable through the iTunes app. They deprecated that a long time ago. Why? Because people were gaming it. They took away our ability. They started banning us for, uh, keyword stuffing in the artist tag and the uh, the author tag of the individual episodes as well. Same thing with the show titles now, right? There, no, no more of that. I'm saying if they get to a point where they feel confident that they themselves know what's in the episode, I think they will begin to disregard what we tell them is in the episode. As far as hmm. the search results go, I think I think there is a future in which this works. That's again assuming that it works, right? Maybe their machine learning is junk. Maybe none of this actually works. The results are terrible. I don't think they're going to give up good results to use a system where they stop regarding our titles and show descriptions. But I also can see this being a way for them to go. Oh, thank God, we don't have to worry about spamming now. We we just can disregard that entirely. So, like in in yours in, in that particular scenario that you just laid out, then there is hope for the guy like me, who does yeah a recap of week one of the NFL, and while we recap all sixteen games, I'm not listing out all thirty two teams and in a manner that all 16 games were played anywhere within the context of my show note. It's just the title NFL Week One Recap, and anybody that's a fan of the NFL knows that. Oh, well, then they obviously recap this particular game. And so, yes, somewhere in the context of that particular program, we recap that particular game, the, the Buffalo Bills game, the New, York, New Orleans Saints game. Those those teams were discussed at some point in this podcast. It's not l- listed anywhere in a show note. You know, those teams aren't mentioned anywhere in a show note. But at the end of the day, it is in that content. It's a good, you know, probably five minutes of the show content uh, and in the particular scenario you just laid out that might get it a little bit higher in the search results. Maybe. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think that there is, again, assuming this works, that's what well, we don't know how it's going to work out with Google long-term either. Is their transcription any good? We all assume that these things will get better over time. I'll tell you this, Jay, going the other way, uh, as far as like text to machine knowledge goes, Apple just announced, uh, again, at WWDC, they announced a big upgrade to Siri. Siri now involves zero recordings of humans, which is how it's always been made before. They take an actor, they put her in a booth, they record uh, um, you know, a million different things, and then they splice those together through software. They, they talked about how that leaves you with static phrases and it doesn't sound natural, and you know, especially if you speak a paragraph at a time, it sounds kind of terrible. So they've now moved, and I think it's called neural text-to-speech is what they referred to it as, Hmm. but it's all machined now. And I got to tell you, it sounds wonderful, and it scares me as a voice actor. Like, as someone who does voice work, this is the first time that I've heard this sort of thing and thought, okay, they got that right. Like, that is, it sounds wonderful. And if they Hmm. can do it from text to speech, 
I got to assume that they're way closer on speech to text than we've seen recently anyway. Or maybe the, again, uh, put a, put enough server farms on it and, and maybe this thing can happen over the next couple of years. And the beauty of machines is the more data that you feed them, the better they get at processing the data too. So um, again, yeah, I think, I think there's a real possibility that that could help us or at least drastically change uh, that part of things, the search part of things over the next couple of years. Here's something that we haven't mentioned yet. What about Windows, right? I, I kept mentioning on a Mac desktop or laptop, you're going to have these three apps as opposed to iTunes. What about those of our listeners and and the broad you know, base of humanity at large that have never owned a Mac piece of hardware? What are those folks uh, going to have? They're going to have iTunes, just like they've always had. At least that's what Apple says today. Apple has no plans, they say, of splitting the three apps out on Windows. And no! It, well, no. listen. So here's today. I don't think it matters. I think you're. Yeah, you, I think you're. You're sarcastic. Oh no, there is exactly right. I don't think this matters today. It is concerning the language that they use. They have no plans to develop the separate apps. And if you look at like how they would have to develop those apps, the actual technology that would be involved in creating a new application for Windows, you can see why there's no upside to Apple doing so and spending the technology and the engineering that would be required to to make that happen. Um, they also say that iTunes will continue to work. But for how long? Once mm. upon a time, Apple produced a Safari web browser for Windows as well. Years ago, when I was in the radio world and had Windows PCs at work and a Mac computer at home, I used Safari at work so that I could sync my my favorites and things like that. Safari doesn't work on Windows anymore. You know why? Because it didn't make sense for Apple to make it anymore. I worry two, three years down the line, we're, we're going to see this iTunes application end of life as well. And uh, I, I don't think that matters a whole lot for listeners because those I don't think there is a large base of people who are actively listening to podcasts through the iTunes desktop application on Windows. I just think Probably that is not. an infinitesimal number of people. Here's who it does matter to, and I know that it matters because I've heard it in the last day and a half. Podcast producers themselves who are Windows-based. Podcast producers who are Windows-based, who don't use Apple technology uh, a lot or at all, iTunes on their Windows is sort of like the one lifeline through which they view this Apple world that the majority of their listeners are still interacting with. Unless you do an Android show or a Windows-focused tech show, the majority of your listener base probably uses Apple devices. So you need to see what it looks like in iTunes so that you can get some glimpse into what they're experiencing, right? The other thing that I've heard from a lot of people is that iTunes is the application they use to create chapters or ID3 tags or, uh, excuse me, I don't think chapter support is actually even included in iTunes and something that you can create in the, the, uh, MP3. I, I misspoke there, but they do use iTunes for the ID3 tagging, and they do use iTunes for the MP3 compression a lot of times. They'll create a WAV file or an ACC file, output that into iTunes, and then use the iTunes Fraunhofer compressor, which is actually quite good, to create the MP3 file. So um, anyway, that that's their concern. They're like, what am I going to do now? Uh, many of them said, oh, this podcast app looks great. Sure. But can it compress my MP3s? Can it ID3 tag? The new podcast app will not be able to do those things. There will, I'm, and I, I have not seen it. I don't know for a fact that this is true. I feel confident in saying the new podcast app will not be able to individually import a single file and ID3 tag that file in an efficient way as the current iTunes application does. It just doesn't make any sense. The podcast app is about just as the podcast app is on iOS and now iPad OS. It's about consumption. It's about subscribing to RSS feeds and getting those through the directory, downloading and playing files. What will do that, maybe, Jay, what will maybe keep those features of production is the music app because of, as I mentioned earlier, those power features like uh, working with your local library, files that you've had for years and years that you never bought from iTunes or that you ripped from CDs in the past, et cetera, et cetera. The new music app will continue to work with all of those files. The new music app will continue to to uh, support smart playlists and things like that. 
It will even support, I've already seen this confirmed by developers who are using the beta, it will even support ripping MP3s, which means it uh, ripping CDs into MP3s, I should say, which means that it keeps the compressor, uh, the compressor. So if you can do that for CDs, you should be able to do that with individual WAV files or ACC files. So if your current process is dragging in your edited podcast to tag it and compress it in iTunes and then putting it into your media host, that should continue to work with the new music app. I would just say to you, there are better ways to do that. Forecast is the app, and I'll put a link in the show to the show notes uh, for this. Forecast is made by Marco Armit. We've mentioned it before. It uses multi-cores. It uses multi-threads. So if you've got a fast computer, it can use the full power of that, unlike iTunes, and uh, it's absolutely free. It includes a lot of automation for ID3 tagging so that when you do one show multiple times, a lot of those fields will be auto-populated. It's very, very cool. Uh, check it out, forecast. There are better ways to do this, is my point, than iTunes. <laughs> but you can still do it in the new version of iTunes if you want to. Two thoughts on this. One, how many people do you think this actually affects? We mentioned how there's so few. How many podcasters are playing with their ID3 tags? A lot, more than you would imagine. For instance, I I personally had argu- quote-unquote arguments about this with both Kerry Green, who is a, a podcast producer and consultant that I greatly respect. I'm, I'm a good friend of his. And then also Ray Ortega, uh, the, the podcast uh, studio, the podcast roundtable guy. Uh, Ray and I got into it because he was talking about you know, hey, will the new podcast app do these things? And I'm like, no, it won't. But Ray, why are you using iTunes to do those things anyway? Like, come on, man. You, there are so many better ways to do it, in my opinion. First of all, uh, whatever but I mean, dog. How many, but, but see, see, this is the thing that I'm thinking. Okay, I know I've been around from the beginning, and I am not the most technologically adept. I have never, and I will repeat that, I have never played with my ID3 tags. So Ever. let me tell you why I just I, sign up. I just sign up for my services and I let whatever, you know, whatever metadata is put into my hosting service to be put onto my ID three tag. So and, and some and some hosts do this better than others. For instance, I'll particularly praise. I know I, I'm not positive actually how Blueberry handles this. Libsyn, uh, I know for a fact there is a checkbox at the bottom that you can say add the ID three tags that I've now inputted in the metadata of this show embed those in the file itself uh, on publish, please. That's a cool sort of final feature. So I know a lot of people, I think probably the vast majority of Libsyn users, well, I say that maybe, maybe most of them don't check that box. Maybe they don't care. Here's why I care about ID3 tags. Once upon a time, and this is less less relevant these days than it was in the past, just because so many modern applications are using streaming protocols and they're accessing most, if not all, of the data that they're serving, the metadata from the RSS feed itself, not from the file. But once upon a time, if you were listening to that MP3 file, that downloaded podcast file, somewhere other than wherever you got it originally. So like, again, if you downloaded files and sunk them to your iPod once upon a time, maybe that iPod doesn't even know about the RSS feed. Or what if you had an off-brand iPod? Or what if you were just, uh, you know, dragging the file over to your desktop and hitting play in Winamp or whatever? If you embedded ID3 tags, if you actually put the metadata for the episode into the file itself, then that would still all populate. And anyone who found that file anywhere they found it, who used it in any good media player, no matter what that ended up being, would get that information. They'd see your show art. They'd see your name as the author. They'd see maybe your website. Maybe they'd see the show description and info about like links and and everything still. Like again, depending upon the quality of the media player. But it was basically universal and it didn't matter where they on-ramped to that file or how they were accessing the file, the experience would be consistent. That's the reason why I started using ID3 tags and why I continue to use them on my own shows as well as my client shows. The other thing is there are too many good pieces of software that make it easy to do so. Most good digital audio workstations will allow you, if, if you're making your MP3 file from your digital audio workstation, whatever you're using to edit, it should also be able to tag that MP3 file with lots and lots of metadata. Uh, For instance, Ferrite, the one that I prefer to use, I easily, in the project, as I'm creating a project to edit, and my dogs are going crazy downstairs, I don't know how much of that is going to come through on the file, I apologize. Um, 
I can put the show note. I can put the artwork, the show notes. Uh, I can in, input uh, keyword tags if I want to. A link for my website, the genre, the copyright info, the author tag. Uh, you know, as well as the file name itself. Like all of that embedded in the file. And again, no matter where that file finds its way to a listener, they'll have all of the info. There won't be any. Hmm. That that's my thing. It's like it's like a digital fingerprint for the file, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, maybe that's less relevant in a world where the vast majority of people, ninety nine point nine percent of people, are interacting with your content through Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts app instead of even your website. But that's where I come from on the idea of ID three tags right. and and why they're important. And uh, and I think a lot of people have just they've been taught by somebody like me to do the id3 tags and so they do them i will say this though lots and lots of people do it through itunes and they are stressed out that they're not going to be able to do it anymore had no second idea thing. second thing is uh, a conversation that happened in the podcasting space a few months ago uh, that I sort of ignored and now maybe needs to be brought up again. Are we looking at a transition here from the MP3 to AAC? I still say no. And the primary reason I say that is because unlike AAC, MP3 is completely unencumbered by patent. No one owns MP3 now. It is com- It is a completely free technology at this point. And because of that, at, just like I mentioned, Ferrite has has been able to incorporate uh, MP3 compression at no expense to that developer. Before that, I had to output it as a wave or an AAC or, or otherwise, and and then sort of like convert it uh, elsewhere. I love that. I love the fact that we have this medium, but also it's continued to be extended. Something that has happened fairly recently in the MP3 world is that we've added chapter support to MP3s natively. Chapter support used to be big in one section of podcasting, but it was always through those, uh, what was the word? They were even called like enhanced podcasts or something, and they all were a different file format, which originally only worked on Apple devices. Lots of other people eventually copied it. It was like you can get them all over everywhere but they were effectively like m4a files they weren't mp3s now we have true chapter support true chapter support again that's built into the id3 so that it can be accessed anywhere there are other things about mp3 uh some technical things and i don't want to speak out of turn because i'm not going to say this exactly right but marco armit in particular has argued for the mp3 spec over spec over aac and one of the reasons that he points to is there's something about the way the metadata is embedded in the file that allows mp3 to be superior for streaming. If we're not going to download the full file with an mp3 file, we can still get the full metadata and even things like chapter info, et cetera, et cetera, right at the top of the file. So we can download mere kilobytes of data and get all of that info to make our choice and maybe skip to a chapter in the middle. Whereas with the AAC format, I believe the the metadata is throughout the file, not in a head, basically. So you you can't get that sort of jump start to get all the info, and then what do you want to do with it? Um, and in a world where lots of us listen to you know four hour episodes of Dan Carlin, <laughs> and in a world mm-hmm. where many podcasters and podcast producers are getting back into the idea of chapters and a good metadata tagging, especially now with the the fact that MP3 is blossoming in the way that it is. I just I feel like I feel like we're in the middle of a renaissance of MP3. Why would we? Why is there any desire to to jump ahead to to something different? Well, it th- seems like Apple might uh, the be only, more interested in you using the AAC. So they have suggested it, but they don't push it at all. It's not enforced at all. I don't I don't anticipate that coming anytime soon. Uh, and then the other thing is, you have to remember that they are the ones that have been so sold out on the open RSS formats. Even still today, if you subscribe in an Apple podcast app, you don't have a relationship with Apple. You have a relationship with my RSS feed. That's where you're making the connection. Apple is merely the directory for that list of feeds. So if they had any desire to close this off, I think we would have seen it. Now, there are some hints in the code for things like um, uh, costs for podcast episodes and a um, – I can't remember the terminology, but something that seemed to hint at maybe premium feeds or locked mm. down feeds in some fashion. 
once we see podcasts you know, alike across the Apple ecosphere, where the app is the same on all their platforms, I do think it's possible at that point that they go, hey, Gimlet has been asking us for years to be able to sell <laughs> episodes. Or, you know, NPR used to come to us and say, why can't we have our members, uh, you know, access premium episodes automatically through the podcast app? Well, we're going to turn that on and we're only going to take 20% of your money for the uh, technology behind that or whatever. You know what? I mean, I, I don't know. I, again, we've talked about this before in a world where Apple wants all the services money. Here's, here's a big audience. Like we have, we, we're going to talk later about some of the money that's in this space. They could access a big chunk of it if they wanted it. Uh, and it might make the whole thing worthwhile. So that was the big news. Apple podcast is coming. If you're on Mac, iTunes is going away. If you're on Mac, it doesn't really mean what that headline says, though. And in particular, if you're on Windows, iTunes isn't going anywhere. iTunes is going to work just the same as it has, which probably means not that well. It's another thing. All of the changes that they've made recently, like with the way that numbering is represented for episodes and things like that, that's supported on Apple Podcasts. It's not showing up properly in the iTunes application. How worried do you think they're going to be about continuing to check on those sorts of bugs in the future where those Windows users are the only ones that are still using iTunes? I'm not saying it's going to be a broken application. I'm just saying don't expect feature parity and don't expect any improvements moving forward if you're on Windows using iTunes. I would strongly suggest you need to move to a new application for uh, uh, podcast consumption. I, I know Pocket Casts has a native Windows application. Pocket Casts is a very good uh, you know, member of the, the podcasting industry and ecosphere. So that would be my primary suggestion, I think I would tell you. Uh, honestly, I tell you, you need an Apple device if you're a podcaster. You need an iPod Touch or an iPad, one of the low-cost. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars. You don't need the Mac Pro, okay? You don't need to go out and buy a Mac Pro <laughs> just because you're a podcaster. We're going to get to that in a second, Jay. What you do need, though, I think, especially if you look at your audience statistics and 60% or more are coming from Apple devices, I think you need an Apple device, a, mo a fairly modern Apple device that can continue to move forward so that you can have the same experience that your listeners are having. Yeah, I mean, I only switched to Apple because I w went to a company where everybody was using Apple. And I was like, oh, OK, I guess so. I mean, I got an iPhone when I was at ESPN. And that was again, you know, I was a guy that. I was originally on a BlackBerry. I had a BlackBerry. I was like, all I need is my email. That's it. Just give me something that'll give me my email. That's all I need. And then eventually Blackberries were going bye bye And I was like, all right, well, I'm doing this podcasting thing. Uh, you might as well switch to an iPhone. That sounds like the perfect thing for me. So I got an iPhone. So I've always used an iPhone. My wife has always used an Android. So she's, you know, she looks at my iPhone and she's like, this thing sort of speaks the same language, but it's like, you know, it's like a, an American talking to a British man with a very thick accent um, and vice versa. When I look at her Google phone and I'm like, this sort of makes sense, but I don't really quite understand it. It's sort of, it's, it's similar. It's just, it's not the device that I'm most comfortable with. And I say this all the time to people, it doesn't matter what programming you use, what software you use, what computer you use, but whatever it is that you do end up using is going to be the one that you're going to love and you're not going to want to change. And that's why when there are changes that get announced like this, people will freak out because, oh my God, this is the way I've done it forever. I love it and I don't have any problems with it. Why are they fixing something that's not broken? Yeah. That sort of, that sort of becomes the reaction and it's ultimately... Uh, I'm glad you're here because this is definitely your thing. This is your bag, baby. But ultimately, the announcements that were made don't have that huge of an impact on what we're doing. To me, I don't think that there's anything that's changing that's, you know, going to be life altering for us. I think there's some good things that will help move us forward as an industry, but nothing that, nothing like that moment that's serial 
popped on the <laughs> popped on our screens, and a little app started getting put automatically on iPhones. So I don't think there's anything like that in here. That is, that is the one other little little mention. So the podcast app itself uh, will be moved to the first page of iOS now on new devices. So and this is a little. It's not quite – if your iPhone, when you upgrade to iOS 13, it won't move the applications at all, right? So so wherever it, it is right now, it'll <laughs> still be there tomorrow. But for a new device, somebody who's just onboarding – or I think this is true for a lot of people. They don't know about like the backup and, and restore process, et cetera, et cetera. So when they get a new phone – it really is a new device and they start over from scratch. I think that happens a lot of times for, for novices. So for those people, the podcast app is going to be more prominent. It's going to be right beside the app store. And one of the reasons specifically that this was, was, um, mentioned is, is that it's, it's going to make it more prominent for, for new listeners potentially. Uh, so that's yeah, my phone. See, see my phone right here. Joel, you probably can't. But I've made like a its own little box that says iTunes things. iTunes and things. Basically, basically anything that came pre, you know, downloaded on the phone right. just w- just went right into that little folder, and I ignore it for the most part. So there are there's more news to come on this. I think first of all there will be a uh, at least one. I think there's a couple of podcast specific sessions this week at WWDC. I'm going to try to watch those the video if if I can't. Uh, it, it's pretty easy to stream that stuff online. If I can't actually watch the sessions, I'll at least uh, read recaps though. And then the other thing is by early July the public beta for Mac OS Catalina as well as iPad OS 13 and iOS 13 will all be available and and I'll be on the beta for all of those uh on my machines. I want to practice so. Catalina. <laughs> Da, 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 I gotta tell you, da, da. I like the name. <laughs> Catalina to me is way way easier than Mojave to spell in particular. Anytime I hype, I type Mojave, it it correct, auto corrects to Mojito. So I uh, I'm glad that uh, that we're sticking with that. One and by the way, I know the song is not Catalina, but it just fits, <laughs> it fits. perfectly. Let it, me let me uh, let me get to one other piece of Apple news here because I think there's another big misconception, and this one's going to be a much shorter topic, but it's something that I want to mention here. I saw a great tweet from Evo Terra, who is a very nice guy. Uh, and he actually wrote about this. Um, but he was sharing a tweet from Michael Pusateri, who has a long thread and I'm going to link to all of this in the show notes, but Michael had a long thread where he outlines who precisely the Mac pro, which I've made a couple of jokes here, uh, for the Apple announced a new Mac pro and a new monitor to go along with it. Um, he talks about who those devices are for because I think there is a lot of misconception online <laughs> um, about the um, viability of the pricing, first of all, and like the reasonableness of anybody uh, needing those devices or wanting those devices or paying for those devices. And the fact of the matter is Apple's going to sell a ton of them because the customer for that Mac Pro and particularly for the monitor that they announced yesterday, uh, it's got a really long name. What it amounts to is a 6K monitor that is 32 inches and uh, capable of not just HDR, which is that high definition, high uh, high dynamic range where you have very, very, very bright brights and very dark darks. Um, but this is called extreme dynamic range. It goes beyond the limits of extreme. what HDR uh, currently constitute. It, it, is a, it is a fabulous monitor. It also you're going to pay five thousand dollars yeah, for the edge, it, but it you costs, only need the seat. <laughs> it costs four nine ninety nine, four thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars for the monitor without any way to hold it up. You can either buy, <laughs> you can either buy a Visa mount for two hundred bucks, or Jay, they sell an adjustable stand that will tilt and and rotate into portrait mode, and it's got all. It is an awesome stand, but they sell that stand. They're going to sell that stand for $1,000, $999. If you want a matte, if you want a matte version of the monitor as opposed to glossy, because maybe you work in a, in a high shining environment or something and you need a matte finish on your monitor. If that's what you need, that's going to cost you an extra thousand dollars. So let's assume that you want a matte monitor and the stand to hang it on. You're going to need seven grand before taxes, Jay, and you still don't have a computer that can run that monitor. Now, that's absurd 
for me, that's absurd for you. That's absurd for basically anybody that's listening to the, this podcast. But it's not really for us. It's it's not a monitor for normal computer use. This is not a computer for normal computer use. The iMac Pro and the standard iMac, the Mac Mini, which is what I want to talk about in a second. All of those devices are consumer devices or pro devices even with the, the iMac Pro. But those are reasonable models of computers for quote-unquote normal people, even people who are professional audio and video producers. What these devices are for, what the Mac Pro is for, and what the monitors specifically are for, are for high-end corporate clients, people that work in corporate environments where they're already spending. For instance, this monitor is compared to, there's a Sony monitor that, it, that it's comparable to that's like a reference monitor for filmmakers when they're uh, mastering for 4K. That monitor, by the way, doesn't do HDR, which this one does, and that monitor sells for like $43,000. So this is a steal for them, but you and I aren't buying that kind of monitor. The same thing with the, with the Mac Pro. We don't need a computer that has 28 cores and 1.5 terabytes of RAM. That is not necessary, even for people who are producing video podcasts. I, I want to talk about people overlooking the Mac Mini. I'm I I'm iOS first. I'm holding up my iPad here. I got iPad uh, Pro 12.9 inch, the new one. I love it. It is my primary device. That's what I use to edit and produce on. But if you're not willing to make the jump into iPad land like I am, Apple sells this amazing computer called the Mac Mini. It starts at under a thousand dollars, I believe. I think the base model maybe it's maybe it's ten ninety nine for the base model, but the base model is very capable. I paid uh, thirteen hundred for the one that I have. That's the mid range model. It is more power than I will ever bring to bear on anything other than like literally. Okay, last week I ep- I edited an episode of uh, Trivial Warfare, which consisted of a three hour raw. Uh, episode with eight individual tracks. I had eight contestants and hosts uh, referenced in that file. That was huge. It was like mm. seven gigabytes. The the project, the the raw project. My iPad handled it fine. My Mac Mini would have smoked it as far as the uh, compression and the you know the the bouncing down of the final file, handling the file and moving around audio independently throughout the episode and editing. All of that was was silky smooth on either one of those devices. For things like this, Jay, I'm capturing this Skype call. I'm recording remote interviews on a regular basis. I'm running programs like Audio Hijack to capture myself locally and you remotely or uh, system audio remotely, et cetera, et cetera. All those sorts of things. Mac minis can handle it and then some. In particular, because of the way that they've offloaded a lot of the uh, actual media processing into separate processors like the T2. The T2 is is basically a mini iPhone chip that's in my Mac mini. And any audio or video processing that happens is offloaded from the primary Intel processor onto that custom-made chip that all it does is want to deal with media. So again, these things are silky smooth and you don't have to spend Oh my God! You don't have to spend these massive amounts of money to to but have people some will. beast. Uh, some people will. Some people will. But I like both. I, so I, I want to talk to both the people complaining about those prices and also the people that are like, "Well, now I can't do the show that I wanted to do because I was waiting to buy that new fancy mm. machine. I can't afford the five thousand dollar iMac Pro, so I can't have a YouTube channel like Marcus does, you know, or whatever. Uh, what's what's the guy? M MBD or M- MBH or whatever." I love I, I do love his videos. Yeah, I can't his Ninja. Marcus Marcus Brownlee or something. I can't remember his name. He does he does uh, tech reviews a lot of times. I really like his videos and they're beautifully shot. He's got a great eye for for video and he has these fancy tools. He got a new iMac Pro when it came out for instance. He was one of the first ones to get one of those devices and reviewed it and everything. But you don't have to have that. There's so much there's so much more affordable technology. And by the way, all of those things that I'm talking about are within the Apple sphere where you're paying the quote unquote Apple tax for their software, which by the way, a lot of people think it's just like a sheer markup. It's not. You can't use Mac, the Mac operating system or, or iPad operating system on an Android device or a Windows PC. It's just not possible. And for me, the software that I'm used to and the things that it enables me to do in a way that I know how to to access those, that's worth the quote-unquote Apple tax. 
But if you don't need that, if you're using Audacity, if you're using Reaper, if you're using Adobe Audition as your primary interaction for podcasting, all of those work cross-platform, and they work just as well on Windows or just as well on Linux as they do on uh, Mac. And you can get a much more affordable, high-powered Windows PC oh, yeah, uh, yeah. and get everything that you need to do. So anyway, I'm, I'm again, this doesn't mean that Apple is out of touch or has lost – you know, their minds in that they're charging a thousand dollars for a stand. I think it is a little bit out of their minds that they're charging a thousand dollars for a stand. But the fact of the matter is they don't plan on you or me buying that. Now, personally, I wish that they would sell me a version of the iMac screen at a consumer price. You know, they used to sell a monitor, for instance, they used to sell like a 30 inch monitor for a couple of thousand dollars. Then for a long time, they had the like the 27 inch Thunderbolt monitors for like nine ninety nine. They sold a ton of those. Sell me the iMac 27 inch screen, you know, 5K resolution, et cetera, et cetera. Sell me that monitor for like a hundred for, for like a grand. I'd, I'd bite probably. I'd save up my pennies. I'd, I'd, you know, use my birthday money and my Christmas money or something, yeah. but like a seven grand monitor, no normal content producer needs that. A, a five, yeah, you'll get it. a six grand you'll computer to start with. Five no, years. no need. Nobody needs that in five years. You'll get it for a thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Maybe not even five years. You might, you may not even have to wait that long, but you know, It'll eventually get to the price that you'll pay. Well, they keep the, so they keep pointing the cons, if you ask them about consumer stuff, they point you to all of these other companies that sell monitors. But for, honestly, if you want a monitor like the iMac screen without buying the iMac, there isn't a third party company that sells that right now. Honestly, no. Trust me. I, listen, I've I've said for years, especially when it comes to podcasting, you don't have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for any of the technology or the equipment that you need to do a podcast and have it sound i hate using the phrase because people hate it good enough right you, you don't you don't need to get decent audio and i even hate using that adjective to get decent audio you don't need to spend a heck of a lot of money you know, a good microphone, you can probably get that for like 20, 40 bucks, a good XLR microphone that will give you a good enough sound that you can plug directly into a laptop. You mentioned you don't have to spend a lot of money on a, on a laptop these days. You know, Chromebooks, well, you can't, well, there is a way to produce on Chromebooks nowadays, but it gets a little more technological, but you know, you can get a decent, you can get a decent laptop. Windows laptop for like 200 bucks. If that, you could even get a refurbished one if you wanted to, if you really wanted to pinch your pennies, you could get a refurbished laptop for under a hundred bucks, get a microphone for like 20, 40 bucks. Your sound is going to be good enough. If eventually you get to a point where you want to upgrade and you want to have a, a more polished, a more technical sounding podcast then then you can spend a little bit more money for phones i know people hate the blue yeti i've used the blue yeti forever and i use it properly dave i was a guest on dave jackson's school of podcasting he's like is that a yeti how the bleep are you sounding so good i'm like because i know how to use it dave you know as long as you know how to use the equipment that you have you can make it sound as good as you need it to sound i i tend to agree with you jay i'm mean, look I, I, I'm not going to be a snob about it. Anchor.fm exists on your smartphone, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. I, iOS or Android. Uh, that's all you need, honestly. You can start a podcast just that simply. We, we believe that most of our listeners are at a different stage of their development as far as podcasters go that maybe Anchor is not what they need. They need something more professional than that. But almost no one that's listening to us, no one, in fact, that's listening to us needs these Mac Pro devices. No, nobody needs this stuff. So, well, I would also say anyone that's listening to us right now doesn't use Anchor either. Yeah, so that's we, probably I mean, not. Listen, I and I mean no disrespect to Anchor. Anchor has its place in the podcasting business. But quite honestly, if you if you were to start a podcast, you're serious. You're a serious person looking to start a serious podcast. You don't seriously consider Anchor as your starting point. Yeah, well, I so I talked to somebody today. Somebody said, "Hey, I've got an idea for doing like a relationship show. I want to talk about my experiences in dating and dating in the South, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how do I get started? 
I said, Anchor, anchor.fm. You've got it on your phone. You've got it on your iPad. You can use it on the web too. It's free to start. Hmm. Um, get in there and see whether you're going to want to stick with podcasting. You know why? Because I, well, sure. I don't think that person is going to want to stick with podcasting. That, okay, that's, that's, that's my fair. That's my point. Well, but see, that's the difference between a serious person looking to start a serious podcast and somebody who's looking to dip their toe and maybe get serious about I, podcasting. And I would rather, I would rather see someone – Try Anchor and decide that they don't like podcasting because it's a lot of work to prep and record and edit and post and promote than to try podcasting and decide that they don't like it because they bought a $7,000 computer and their wife doesn't love them anymore. <laughs> Listen, the only reason why I do this podcast is because you produce it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> anyway, I, I love I love my Mac Mini. I love my iPad. I'm especially excited about iPad OS. I, we didn't even – this is not really the show to talk about that, but there's all sorts of new features now that they've split that out as its sort of separate operating system. There's a, there's a lot of new multitasking stuff. I've even got – I've got mouse support now, Jay. I'm going to be able to use a mouse with my iPad, uh, which is very, very cool. No. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, uh, lots of cool stuff if you're into the Apple ecosphere. Uh, don't trust the headlines, though, and don't panic about the death of iTunes. Just be aware oh that over the course of this summer, you're going to hear a few things. You might need to make oh, a couple of back-end dying. changes about your show, but that's it. If you listen, if you pay attention to the ecosphere, many, many people are going to tell you what you need to do way before you have to do it. No one's ever going to listen again. <laughs> so, Jay, let's talk Joel. About outside of the Apple ecosphere. There were some dollars and cents reports that came out. Yeah, so a little bit of news out there besides the Apple stuff. Um, the IAB and PWC uh released their report on podcast revenue in 2018 and ladies and gentlemen there was an increase of 53 percent year on year in advertising revenue podcasts from companies that self-reported this is an important statement <laughs> companies that self-reported to the iab uh made 479 million dollars in u.s ad revenue uh, they, that, as I mentioned, that's a 53% increase from what they had made in 2017. Uh, and they are now estimating that the podcast industry will get to $1 billion in advertising revenue alone in 2021. And I meant, I, I make a point about that because this number does not include things like Patreon, merchandising, all those other things. Items that we've discussed for months on this show about ways to create different revenue streams for your podcast, selling services to your audience, et cetera, et cetera. This number is simply advertising revenue only. What I thought was also interesting about this report is dynamically inserted advertising is responsible for nearly half of all of that revenue, that $479 million number. That is... Uh, I also believe a very large increase from previous years. Uh, now, remind reminder to everyone out there, dynamic ads does not necessarily mean pre-produced radio ads that you hear often. A service such as VoxNest, uh, which is the parent company in the Spreaker, they use dynamic ads to help uh, put these types of advertisements, the Geico's, the progressives, the McDonald's commercials, all the same ones that you would typically hear on the radio. It doesn't necessarily mean that when we're talking about dynamic ads, all we're talking about is the way that the ads are being served to the podcaster. It could be a host read ad that they have pre-recorded, put into the system, and then it changes out. Once the campaign has come to an end, it will get removed from that particular podcast or vice versa. If there's a new ad, it can be put into old content uh, that already has been produced. But how, as we've seen, there is always a long tail on any podcast and it might be longer on some than on others. Uh, but there's always new audience coming to discover your podcast and those ads will be fresh no matter when they listen to podcasts. So this is, uh, this is very exciting news. Uh, I like hearing $1 billion by 2021. Uh, that's only three years away. That, that doesn't seem likely, but I mean, heck, even if we just see 53% every year, which we probably won't, 
uh, I mean, we can get there, right? Well, it seems – that does seem – well, so I'm of two minds. It seems, first of all, incredibly optimistic. But on the flip side, we have talked so much, Jay, you and I particularly, about how undervalued the podcast ad market is – in comparison to the radio ad market specifically, as far as like the amount of listenership that we currently have versus the amount of ad dollars. So maybe this is a recognition, finally, since you and I are not the only ones in the space saying that, by the larger ad industry of that fact. And and a, and a suggestion that, hey, over the next two years, we're going to fix it, sort of. Like, again, a billion dollars – in 2021, if we look at the continued growth of the industry, too, I don't think would be still a true representation of our worth in ad dollars yet. But it'd be much closer to we wouldn't be so undervalued at that point. Mm. Uh, just to give you that uh, comparison, uh, BIA Kelsey estimates U.S. terrestrial commercial radio to have earned $14.2 billion in 2018. So that's $14.2 billion with a B versus uh, $479 million. There's a huge gap between radio advertising and podcast advertising. Very large. By the way, Sirius XM satellite radio earned uh, $5.8 billion just – in advertising revenue that does that number does not include their subscription revenue in that particular number that's crazy that's crazy a uh, lot of money a lot of money hanging out there jay by the way if you remember from edison research more people are listening to podcasts in their car than sirius in their car uh and sirius made 5.8 billion with a b versus 479 million in podcasting. I guarantee you those XM Sirius customers are not making up that listening time at home. Uh, I will say this. There's got to be a huge portion of that Sirius revenue that are business customers, right? People that pay for a, a business license to use the Sirius XM music in their, in their uh, locations. I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that, that's uh, – that is very interesting, and it will be interesting to see in particular one of the other things that, that Apple announced yesterday were expansions and improvements to CarPlay. This is an area where Google is also driving hard, you know, the connected dashboard so that when we get in our car in any modern vehicle or in one with a modern radio even, you'll be able to effectively access all of your entertainment right there from your phone in an easier way. As they continue to improve that, Again, I, I don't think people are choosing the radio because they want it. They're choosing the radio because it's so easy, because it's built in, right. because it's automatic. So as we make other things built in, easy, and automatic, uh, we will uh, continue to eke away. Yep, I agree. One more item, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For me to, to jump in on. Um, Tim Ferriss. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a popular podcaster. You may have heard of him. Uh, he recently... Uh, put out a blog post explaining that he is going to do a six month experiment where his show will no longer have ads will no longer have sponsors. It will simply be a donation model period. Um, obviously he's going to compare what uh, his revenue is in that six months on the donation only model versus what he would make from podcast advertising. I feel like, Tim Ferriss probably will do better on the donation model than he will on the podcast model. Uh, I'm not alone because uh, my uh, man crush, Tom Webster at uh, Edison research had a great tweet saying it's easy to monetize like Tim Ferriss. Step one already be Tim Ferriss. Uh, and to further highlight that uh, there was a great blog post from uh, Jake Reisider of the dark Knight diaries about uh, podcasters that you can emulate. Uh, and mentions how guys like Tim Ferriss came with a built-in audience before they started podcasting of over a million followers. And if they've already got that audience, when they created a podcast, they already had a ginormous amount of listeners to listen to their podcast. Most people, like you and me, Joel, we don't come built in with a million followers. Uh, even me, who worked at ESPN for a long time and has made – uh, a little bit of a name for myself. I used to joke I'm a minor internet celebrity. Uh, I don't come with a lot of followers behind me. So if you have a huge built-in audience, 
you can follow this donation model. If you're starting from scratch and you're nobody, if you're that person who's wants to talk about dating uh, in the South and their experiences uh, with that, and they have zero following, they should not start a donation model. If you have, I've, I've heard Todd Cochran talk about this. If you have less than a thousand listens per show, you should not be investigating the donation uh, model because it's not going to go very well for you. Uh, you're going to be very disappointed. And ultimately, uh, it could actually be a detriment to your show in the long term. I, I'm going to go with the advice that that Jonathan Oakes gave uh, a couple of years ago. I think it was at PodFest. He talked about maybe podcast movement. Either way, he talked about you got to, you know, they've got to, your listeners have a love meter. You have to fill their love meter completely up. You have to completely just ping that that gauge all the way to the other end. And then when they overflow, that overflow is what you get some of. You You don't get to ask them to immediately put in for gas just because they're onboarding to your show. That's not the way this works. You, it's just, it's not going to work out for you long term. It's just not. Um, that's one of the reasons why I am so supportive of the dynamic ad insertion model, even though I don't love all of its implications. And I do understand that some people don't like it, but I think that when you have an industry where so many people have content that has value but the audience is never going to be large enough to support, you know, traditional means of sponsorship or or revenue in any way, or even just direct support, as as we mentioned with, you know, Patreon or something. Dynamic ad insertion can take away hosting fees, and can even put some money in your pocket, it, no matter how small your audience is. That is what we're talking about, and that can yep. work for podcasters of all size, particularly as we get companies that do it better and implement it better and continue to hone that model. And you have to be accepting of it. Yeah, You have to understand that the ads that are going to be put into your show, yeah, they're the same ads that you hear on radio. Yeah, ads are ads are evil. Ads are horrible. We hate ads. But at the same time, you have to understand that those ads are being put on your show and they're paying you. Right. Do you want to make some money or do you want to make no money? Uh, That that ultimately is the question that you have to come to accept and understand as you're building an audience that to get the higher valued ads. This is the thing that always blows my mind. People are like, well, if I get a if I get to that, you know, 20,000 listens per episode you know, I can't wait because then I'll have ads and then and they'll have so much value for my particular audience. Yeah, that's great. But understand that when you do get that advertiser, they're not paying you out of the kindness of their heart. They're paying you because they believe your audience is going to buy their product. If your audience ultimately does not go and buy their product, that advertiser's not going to continue to pay you money. So you have to do everything in your power to become a salesperson for that particular product, I think a lot of podcasters don't get that particular concept of how advertising works. You're, you're not just getting money because you have a show and you have this amount of people listening to your show. You're getting money because the advertiser wants that particular amount of people to hear their ad and go buy their product. That's why you're getting money. I mean, I don't... I'm going to use the Hulu example. I think about this a lot, Jay, because Hulu makes it very obvious for you to consider these two alternatives. You can buy into Hulu and stream their programs for $5.99 a month with advertising, or you can pay them $11.99 a month and get no advertising. Now, that's just for their streaming stuff, not their like cable package or whatever. But it's, it's a question you can ask yourself every month. How much does the advertising bother me? My answer is not $6 worth. I keep, I'm on the 599 model. And one of the reasons I justify that to myself is I can have more streaming service. I can buy another 599, 699 streaming service with that money instead of paying Hulu not to show me advertising. The advertising is not a bad thing for me. One last item before we get to what we're listening to. And this is a really quick one. Uh, I mentioned Tom Webster earlier. Edison Research released their study on social media habits, uh, which was something that was brought up in the share of air. And as I've written here, it could also be redescribed as the death of Facebook uh, and where all of those people. I know we mentioned that uh, Facebook lost essentially Pennsylvania and Las Vegas. Were those the two states? I don't remember. Um Year over year, uh, the number of people that are using Facebook, this particular report 
dives deeper into that particular number and exactly why people uh, weren't using it. So uh, there's a link in the show notes. Go ahead and check that out. You don't need us to really talk much about that. Just know that there's different age groups that are using different apps. And again, it goes towards if you're promoting your podcast, understand who your audience is, where they are and be where they are. So if you have an, if you have a podcast that appeals to a younger audience, the 18 to 24s, Facebook is not going to be the place for you to promote your podcast because they ain't using Facebook. They're on Snapchat and Instagram. Similarly, if you have a podcast that is geared more towards an older audience, say even the 55 plus, they are using Facebook and they're actually using more of Facebook. So that's the type of information that you can get from the folks at Edison Research that is oh so valuable to help you make your podcast better and help promote it better. Fascinating. All right, Joel, you want to talk about what we're listening to? Yes, let's talk about uh, what we're currently listening to. Uh, last week, I mentioned that I was going to listen to the Inside Star Wars podcast from Mark Ramsey and uh, Wondery. And I mentioned that, that I feared that uh, there was going to be a lot of stuff that I already heard because there's been so much content on that particular topic. And my fear was realized. Unfortunately, I had heard a lot of the stories. What was really confusing, though, and this is from Mark Ramsey himself. He said, quote, my goal here was to remind us all why we fell in love with the franchise in the first place. If you or someone you know is or ever has been a fan of Star Wars, then this is the show for them. But so far in two episodes that have been released, and there'll be a new one released tomorrow, uh, it's mostly about Lucas's start in the movie business. And frankly, his start has nothing to do with why I love Star Wars. Like The story of George Lucas is not why I love Star Wars. So that was a bit confusing. The other thing is there's a lot of recreations and fictionalized conversations. And at one point, Mark says that he's sitting down with George Lucas and they only have about an hour to talk. But I don't know if that was real because the voices all sort of sound the same, like, I couldn't tell if that was really George Lucas or if that was Mark imitating George Lucas. And if he really did sit down with George Lucas for an hour, I want to hear that conversation. Quite honestly, I don't need all the other storytelling. I want to hear the one hour raw interview with George Lucas because there ain't many people that get a chance to sit down with George Lucas for an hour and record it and talk to him about all this sort of stuff. So, I mean, ultimately, the show isn't really for me. I feel like it's more for those like Star Wars historians. And again, unfortunately, if you're that kind of fan, you've probably already heard these stories and you already know these stories. So hmm. uh, I wish I could, I wish I could give it a, you know, at least an earbud or half an earbud, but I have to give it zero earbuds. So the very interesting. The, and in particular, the idea of the, uh, the fact that they've got some, you know, not faked, reproduced audio uh, or dramatized audio in it, and then maybe some real uh, interviews or at least interviews that are seemingly real or presented as seemingly real. That that would be an odd juxtaposition to have both. You know, there's another podcast. I don't know if you've heard about this or heard uh, uh, heard it yet. It's called Blockbuster, which is all dramatizations, and the idea is that they play out the dialogues, the actual interactions that happened between George Lucas and Steven Spielberg over the course of them uh, getting ready to do Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Indiana Jones and Star Wars, like them discussing hmm. those um, – it's dramatizations or, or fictionalizations of several conversations between the, the two of them. I've only listened to just a little bit. I've sort of got it like queued up to binge through at some point uh, when I wasn't doing so much work on Apple actually. Um, but it is, it is in my list. Uh, I, soon I think that's going to be a currently listening. What I have been listening to – uh, yesterday and today, though, was a specific episode of the Accidental Tech Podcast. Uh, we mentioned Marco Arment a lot on this show. He's the creator of the Overcast app. He is also the host or one of the hosts of the Accidental Tech Podcast. Episode 329 is about – it's a, the live show from WWDC. They recorded it last night, and the vast majority of the episode is them discussing the Mac Pro. I love this episode because both Marco and John Syracuse are 
are devout Mac Pro fans in particular. Like John Syracuse, uh, one of the other co-hosts, has been hanging on to the old cheese grater Mac Pro that was not the last model, but the model before. His his computer is literally like 10 or 11 years old now, and he's been limping along with it, upgrading what he can in it while he waits on the next new actual Mac Pro. And this should be it. Most of the episode was them commiserating about exactly how much money they're going to have to spend to get the machine that they want. <laughs> um, but it was for someone who is a big fan of the technology, who is in love with the sports cars of the computer world, which is what this Mac Pro is. It was exciting and enjoyable to hear them be satisfied. You know, other than the pricing, they were like, this was the machine that we've asked for for years and years and years. It was very similar to the way that I feel about the iPad OS announcement. Like, this is what I've been looking for. Yes, thank you. I can use my iPad like I want to all the time. So anyway, it's 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 nice to hear people get things they want, Jay. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. That'd be great. That'd be great. My birthday is coming up this weekend. You know what I want? You know what I want for my birthday? Uh, a job. Those, That'd be great. One, one of those uh, <laughs> one of those very successful companies in the uh, the booming podcast industry to uh, to scoop you up as a new employee. I want one of those fancy things called a job. What's, what's that, that thing we be... used to do back in the day? You'd go to it every day. They'd send you money at the end of the week. Oh yeah, a job. Yeah. A lot of those. Pe- a lot of people out there have one of those. <laughs> like I want to say like. I think there's something like 4% of us that don't, but like, <laughs> I'd like to be part of the 96%. That'd be great. Can we, can we make that happen? That'd be fantastic. Name it and claim it, Jay. Name it and claim it. All right, folks. I would love that. Let's tell them where they can find you on Twitter, by the way. I am at the real pod Vader on Twitter. On Facebook, you can find me facebook.com slash pod Vader page. And you can email me. You'll use my podcast email. It's the best way to get me next fan up at gmail.com. That's it, folks. And you can find me at The Rogue's Life on Twitter or at propodcastingservices.com. Until next week, uh, when we bring you a more balanced uh, serving of Apple and other news, perhaps. We've been your hosts. I'm Joel. I'm Jay. Give me a job. <laughs> Give me a Mac Pro. Or just a stand. I'll take the stand and pawn it. Buy a new computer. Uh, <laughs> we're always listening. <laughs> that's That's... That's the exit strategy. We'll we'll buy we'll buy stands. <laughs> we get, if we could just hijack a truck full of stands, Jay, think of it, man. It's, it's a truck full of wow. money. <laughs> wow, look at this. Yeah, I know I ain't seen it all. But I've seen enough. Yeah, I know I ain't seen it at all. But I've seen Always Listening is a proud member of the Two Guys and a Rogue Network. You can find all of our past episodes, including more than 100 podcast reviews, at alwayslisteningpod.com. In Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. For help on your podcast, visit propodcastingservices.com. Our theme song is Enough from Bethany Raven.
two guys and a rogue. I'm one guy. I'm the other. And this is The Network.